All right, welcome everybody. Today we're going to look at the um, the test review for conservation of energy. Uh, we've got a test coming up, test on Friday. Um, so if you have any questions about this review, hopefully this video helps you out. Feel free to pause it, rewind it, watch it as many times as you need to try to understand the concepts. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, in this first scenario here, we've got a ball that's being released um, down this ramp. So we're going to position, we're going to say that the ball here started at A, it rolled down this ramp at B, it'll eventually go through the loop here, and then we want to know how high up on the other side is it going to go. So a couple things that we do know, we know that the ramp is 15 meters high at point A. Um, we need to figure out, in number one, how high the ball will go up the side uh, after going through the loop. Well, we know that um, if energy is conserved, then whatever energy that the ball starts with at A, it's going to end with on the other side. So if you think about it, if the ball starts at A, it's got all the potential energy based off of 15 meters high. All that potential energy will then transfer to or transform to a different form of energy, pass through the loop, and if energy is not lost, then we would expect that ball to reach the same point on the opposite side of the ramp, which is also 15 meters high. So if energy is conserved, the ball will go all the way up on the opposite side, reaching a height of 15 meters. All right, and the second one's asking me to describe the energy conversion of the ball. Well, at the highest point, it's got the most potential energy. It's got max potential energy here. At the lowest point, it's moving the fastest. It's at the lowest height. Therefore, at this point, it's going to have the max kinetic energy. And then once it goes around the loop and up the other side at when it reaches the highest point again here, it's going to have the most potential energy again. So we can describe our energy conversion starting off as potential energy. And then from potential energy, it's going to transform to kinetic energy when it reaches the bottom of the ramp. And it's moving the fastest. Then once it goes through the loop and up the other side of the ramp, it's increasing height and the ball slowing down. So it's transforming back to potential energy. And there's our energy conversion. Number three says, what will the velocity of the ball be at point B at the bottom of the loop? Well, remember that the potential energy at the top is equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom. So what that translates to is my energy equation for potential, which is mass times gravity times height. And for kinetic, it's one-half mass times velocity squared. Well, the one thing that I don't know about this ball is its mass. But if I'm trying to solve for V, eventually I'm going to have to take this M and divide it to the other side. If the mass is the same, because we're talking about the same ball, if I take any number here and divide it by itself, it, I get one. It cancels out, essentially. So I don't necessarily need the mass. I can calculate this as GH equals one-half V squared. So those variables I do know. So I'm going to rewrite that up here. So GH equals one-half V squared, where G is uh, positive 9.8. H is... Um, I'm sorry, 15 is what it's starting at, the potential energy at the highest point, 15, equals 1 half, and V is unknown. So 9.8 times 15 is 147. So I get 147 equals 1 half V squared. And if I continue this over here because I'm out of space, um, I've got a fraction here. So it's 1 divided by 2, so the opposite of divided by 2 is to multiply 2 
by 2. So you got to multiply both sides by 2. And when I take 147 and multiply it by 2, I get 294 equals V squared. And the last step is getting V by itself, and that's to take the square root of 294. So you have to take the square root of V and 294, and when you do that, you get a velocity of 17.15 meters per second at the bottom of the pathway. All right, moving on here, number four, it says if the velocity of an object doubles, um, what happens to the kinetic energy of that object? Well, we know, this was a previous question earlier in the packet, we know that kinetic energy is proportional to the velocity squared, okay? So you got to think about it. Because your velocity is squared, that has an effect on the kinetic energy. It's not as easy as saying, well, if the velocity doubles, the kinetic energy does the same. Yes, it's a direct relationship, but it's directly related to the square of the velocity, okay? So what does that look like? Well, Let's rewrite this as equals, let's say uh, my velocity started off at 1. And 1 squared is 1. So when my velocity is 1, my kinetic energy is 1. So this is our baseline. So the question says if the velocity doubles. So now I'm going to put in here for velocity a 2, and I have to square it because my velocity is squared. So now 2 squared is Four. So when my velocity was 1, my kinetic energy was 1. When my velocity doubled to 2, my kinetic energy is now 4. So it started off at 1, and now it's 4. So therefore, when my velocity doubles, my kinetic energy quadruples. It's 4 times greater. Okay, and number five, we want to draw separate graphs that represent kinetic energy, potential energy, and mechanical energy, which is also total mechanical energy versus time. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to label my graphs. I'm going to label uh, this first graph as Ke versus time. The second graph I'm going to label as Pe versus time. And my third graph I'm going to label Me or if you want to label it TME, total mechanical energy, versus time, you can. So there are my three graphs labeled and ready to go. So kinetic energy, if I toss an object into the air, it's moving fastest at the lowest point. Okay, so when the time is essentially a fraction of a second, I've got the most kinetic energy. When the object is at its highest point, it's moving the slowest, so it's got the least kinetic energy. And as it comes back down over time, my kinetic energy increases again. So you get a graph that looks like this. Okay, Kinetic energy and potential energy are inversely related. So I should expect to see the graph flipped. And the reason being is that at the lowest point, you've got the least height and the least potential energy. As the ball goes up, it reaches its maximum height, which has the most uh, potential energy. And as it falls back down, its height decreases. And remember, potential energy is dependent on height. So you get a graph that looks something like this. Now, we know that there's a trade-off between, between chemical, I'm sorry, kinetic energy and potential energy. And that trade-off allows energy to be conserved which allows my total mechanical energy to remain constant, and it's going to be a flat horizontal line showing me the max uh, mechanical energy. Number six, what's the approximate difference in gravitational potential energy uh, between a two-kilogram box sitting on a one-meter-high shelf versus the same box on a three-meter-high shelf? So I'm looking at the gravitational potential energy, or sometimes referred to as simply just PE. 
okay? So I've got a box, two kilogram box in both scenarios. The first box is sitting at one meters high, and the second one is at three meters high. So again, this one was also done uh, previously in the packet. So all you gotta do is calculate the potential energy of each and take the difference. So we're gonna calculate the potential energy of the box on the two on the one meter high shelf. So the mass was two. Gravity is going to be a positive 9.8, and the height is one meter. So two times 9.8 times one gives you 19.6 joules. If I calculate the potential energy of the second box, it had the same mass. Gravity will also be the same. But now the height is 3 meters. So 2 times 9.8 times 3 gives you 58.8 joules. So obviously when you increase the height of an object, its potential energy increases as well. So now you need to take the difference, which is simply subtracting. So you get 58.8 minus 19.6 and you get a difference of 39.2 joules of energy. Okay, next scenario here, number seven and eight, referring to the diagram uh, up here above. You've seen this one before earlier in the packet, where I've got a ball at position A. It's gonna move um, this direction and it's gonna follow this pathway to point B, and then increase in height to C, increase height even more to D and E. So one thing that I mentioned before when you first saw this was that D and E were at the same height. Okay? So the question says, as the object moves from the starting point at A across the surface, the sum of the uh, gravitational potential and kinetic energies is what? Well, remember that word sum is referring to the total. So the total mechanical energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy. If energy is conserved, then the sum of them will remain constant. The total energy will not change no matter where that ball is along its path. It might transform from one form to the other. There might be more potential than kinetic at any point or vice versa. But the total, the sum of its energy, will always remain the same. It will remain constant. Question 8 says, at what point is the kinetic energy less than at point C? So kinetic energy, depending on velocity. And I want to know where it's the lowest than point C. Where is it lower than point C? So here's point C, okay? So if kinetic energy is dependent on height, then at, I'm sorry, if kinetic energy, excuse me, if kinetic energy is dependent on velocity, then you gotta think, where is this ball moving the fastest? Well, it's moving the fastest at B at the lowest point. So that means at position A, C, D, and E, it's gonna have um, it's going to be moving slower. The question says at point C, where is it less? So it's faster at B, which means that it's going to be slower at A, D, and E. So at A, D, and E, those are three points where it has less kinetic energy than at point C. All right. And number nine says, if a ball were to have an initial velocity of 35 meters per second at point A, then encounter a hill, what would be the height of the hill? So think about what information is given to you here. It tells you the velocity is 35 meters per second. So it's telling you V at point A. 
So this ball is going to move from point A this direction and increase height to point B. Well, if the ball is moving the fastest at A, this is really the kinetic energy of the ball at the bottom of its path. And that means when it reaches point B, this is the potential energy at the top of its path. What we've talked about before is that the potential energy at the top is equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom. So if mass doesn't matter, if it's the same mass all the way up, just like we talked about in um, number three, then the potential energy at the top without the mass is GH, and the kinetic energy at the bottom without mass is one-half V squared. So now all I'm doing is solving for H. So I know that G is 9.8, H is unknown, one half V is 35 squared. Okay, so all you have to do is take your uh, velocity, square it, so 35 squared times a half gives you 612.5. So I'm going to rewrite this up here. So I get 612.5 equals 9.8 H. And my last step to get H by itself is to divide both sides by um, 9.8. And when I do that, then H becomes 62.5 meters. So that ball will reach a height of 62.5 meters as it goes up the hill. Number 10 says describe how the energy transforms along the ramp. So at the bottom of the ramp, where it's got the most kinetic energy and it's moving the fastest, it's got all or mostly kinetic energy. As it progresses and as it moves up this ramp, it's increasing height. And we can assume that the ball is going to slow down. So if it's increasing height and slowing down, it means its kinetic energy is decreasing and its potential energy is increasing. So there's my energy transformation, kinetic energy to potential energy. And number 11, I've got a car that's traveling at a constant velocity. This is important. Constant velocity uh, going up a hill from point X to point Y. I want to describe the changes in KE, PE, and mechanical energy, um, if there are any. So, if the car is going up the hill, then the obvious one is that uh, if it's increasing in height, then the potential energy must also be increasing. Okay? If the velocity is constant, meaning its kinetic energy has to also be constant as well. If the velocity is not changing, then the kinetic energy is not changing either. And then mechanical energy. Well, if your potential energy is increasing as it goes up the hill, then that means that your total mechanical energy must also be increasing. If your potential energy increases and your kinetic energy is constant, then that means your total energy has to also increase. And in number 12 on the side, describe the changes of, a, of energy of a pendulum as it swings back and forth. So you all saw this one before. Um, I'm going to just draw a quick pendulum. If, if you want to draw this, you can. All right, so let's say that this is our pendulum, and it's swinging back and forth over and over again. Okay, so identify the highest points. Here's the highest point on this side. Here's the highest point on this side. Think about what energy uh, is dependent on height. There's your answer. So at these points, it's got the most potential energy because potential energy is dependent on height. Kinetic energy is dependent on velocity. So think about where the pendulum is moving the fastest, or where is the pendulum the lowest? 
So remember, potential energy and kinetic energy are inversely related. So your, max, your potential energy at the top is equal to your kinetic energy at the bottom. So at this point, we have the most kinetic energy. And in between this point and this point, my potential energy and kinetic energy are equal to each other. All right, moving on to the back. Uh, we're on page 18. Let me zoom in a little bit for you here. So we're going to look at some calculations. Um, number 13 says an object has a kinetic energy of 400 joules. So it's telling me what Ke is. Um, and a speed of 10 meters per second. So it's telling me the velocity. I want to determine its mass. So kinetic energy is equal to 1 half times mass times velocity squared. So now I just plug in what I know. My kinetic energy was 400. So that equals 1 half. Mass is unknown. And the velocity is 10. So 400 equals 10 squared is 100. 100 times a half is 50. So I get 50 times m, and my last step to get m by itself is to divide 50 to the other side, and 400 divided by 50 is 8, therefore the mass is 8 kilograms. In number 14, the following object has a total energy of 250 joules. It has 150 joules of kinetic energy. At what point is its or at that point, what is its potential energy? So total energy is equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy. So if your total energy is 250, that's equal to your potential energy, which is what we're trying to find, plus your kinetic energy, which is given to you. It's 150. Now you need to solve for PE. And all you have to do is take this positive 150 Subtract it to the other side. So 250 minus 150 gives me 100 joules of potential energy. So at that point where the kinetic energy is, two, is 150, I've got 100 joules of potential energy. At number 15, a wrecking ball has 30,000 joules of potential energy at its highest point. How much kinetic energy will it have at the lowest point? Remember, the potential energy at the top equals the kinetic energy of that same object at the bottom of its path. So the potential energy at the top is 30,000. Therefore, the kinetic energy at the bottom has to also be 30,000. For 16 through 22, we're talking about heat energy now. So we are going to determine what method of heat transfer is uh, presented with the scenario. So remember our heat uh, methods of transfer were conduction, convection, radiation. So if cool air sinks to the floor, so air is a gas, it's a fluid, it's sinking to the floor because it's cooling down, there's a change in density. The molecules move slower, they get closer together. This is convection. Touching a hot stove. So if there's direct contact between an object and its heat source, then that is known as conduction. Using a greenhouse to grow plants in the winter. So a greenhouse is a house made primarily out of a transparent material, usually glass, maybe uh, some sort of plastic um, that's cut off from the elements outside, and it's heated by the sun, which is radiation. The sun heats up the inside of the car, so same concept. It's heated by the sun. The sun is not directly touching the car, so that's radiation. Spoon gets hot from stirring a cup of coffee. So you got a spoon 
directly inside the coffee, causing it to heat up. That's direct contact. That's conduction. Um, near the ceiling, the air is warmer in a room or in the second floor of a house. The, the second floor is usually warmer because warm air rises. That is convection. And does not require matter. So the light from the sun can travel through outer space, which is an area void of matter. Um, that, is re that is referred to as radiation. And the last one here says, draw arrows to show the heat transfer between the objects shown. So remember, heat always travels from hot objects to cold objects. So identify of these three, you've got one at 15 degrees Celsius, one at 25 degrees Celsius, one at 10 degrees Celsius. So the first step should be to identify the hottest one. The hottest one is a 25 degrees Celsius one. 15 and 10 are significantly cooler. So if energy moves from hot to cold, then heat energy is going to transfer from the 25 degrees Celsius one to the 10 degrees Celsius one and to the 15 degrees Celsius uh, block. All right, and on the right side here, number 24, I want to go through some of these statements and identify them as true or false. So A says an object gains heat, it will begin to expand, which is known as thermal expansion. Um, you saw the demo of the ball and the ring. When I put the, the uh, at room temperature, the ball fit inside the ring with ease. But as soon as I heated up the ball inside the flame, those molecules moved around faster, they moved around uh, more, they took up more space, causing that ball to expand and it didn't fit in the ring anymore until it was cooled back down. So this is a true statement. Uh, and B, as an object loses heat, the particles in the object will speed up. That is actually a false statement. As an object loses heat, the particles in the object will actually do the opposite, and they'll slow down. Um, and C, an object with a higher specific heat will gain or lose heat quicker than an object with a smaller specific heat. So that is also a false statement. So specific heats are referring to the amount of energy needed to change the temperature. Um, objects with a high specific heat uh, require a lot of energy to change their temperature. Objects with low specific heats require less energy to change their temperature. So an object with a higher uh, specific heat will gain or lose heat slowly or slower than an object with a smaller specific heat. Uh, metals typically have small, low specific heats, which allow them to heat up and transfer energy very rapidly. Um, something like water, water has a very high specific heat, uh, which means that um, it requires a lot of energy to change its temperature. Uh, one good example of that is if you go to the beach. If you go to the beach in the middle of August or July or June, it could be upwards of 95 degrees. Okay, When you walk barefoot on that sand, the sand feels very hot on your feet. But if the sand and the water are both heated by the same sun, once you step into the water, the water feels significantly cooler than the sand because it requires so much energy to change its temperature. So even though the sun is heating the water and the sand um, the same, water just requires so much more energy uh, because it has a high specific heat. Um, and D, if one object gains heat, another object must lose heat. That is a true statement. One thing cannot get warm without something else get cold. So if you hold an ice cube in your hand, the ice cube will get warm because your hand is losing energy. And number 25, the best insulator. So in, remember, an insulator is a substance or material that um, reduces the flow of energy or stops or prevents energy from flowing. That's going to be things that have a high specific heat, um, like D has a specific heat of 4,000. Um, so that's going to be our best insulator. A conductor is the opposite, and it transfers energy very quickly, 
which means it's going to require the least specific heat, uh, which is 400, and that is substance B. Now look at number 27. Um, it says, explain why a hard drive feels colder than a book, even though both are at the same temperature. So this was one of the videos that I asked you to watch. Um, so the hard drive was made of metal. Um, therefore, metals are good conductors, and they transfer energy very rapidly. So metals are good conductors, and therefore when you touch it, it removes energy uh, more rapidly from your hand. compared to the book, which is made of paper, um, and the book is more of a, an insulator uh, than a conductor. So metals are good conductors, and it removes energy quicker uh, than the book. And we could say the book is a good insulator. Uh, number 28, a piece of crushed ice and an ice cube are the same temperature. Compare their thermal energy of each. So thermal energy is referring to the amount of uh, matter or the, the mass of the object. So the amount of particles in an object. So crushed ice is a very tiny piece of ice. Uh, therefore, it has very few particles or molecules compared to an ice cube. So the crust ice, crust ice, crust, geez, I can't say that, crushed ice, there we go, um, has less thermal energy than the ice cube because it has less mass. The ice cube um, has more thermal energy because it has more mass, more molecules moving around. And the last one here. Um, I've got three objects of equal material, shape, and mass. They are in contact with each other. Determine the equilibrium temperature of each. So remember that energy moves from hot to cold. So that means that the hottest one is going to transfer energy to the not-so-hot ones. Okay, so when it does that, it will continue to do that until all three of these objects are at equilibrium. They're at the same temperature. So the easiest way to do this is find the average. Okay, and we should all know how to take an average at this point in our high school careers. You're going to take the sum of all three uh, materials and then divide them by the number of materials you have, which is 3. So 10 plus 10 plus 40 all summed together, divided by, and we've got 1, 2, 3. So 10 plus 10 plus 40, all divided by 3, gives me an average temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. That means over time, <clears throat> once this block re, uh, transfers its energy to both of these, which are cooler, they will all reach 20, 20, and 20 degrees Celsius. So this is the review. Our test should be tomorrow. Um, I encourage you to re-watch this video, work through the review again, go back and look at your notes um, and practice examples uh, in order to prepare you for tomorrow's test.